Um, in this session, we'll talk about uh, estimation of uh, regenerative breaking energy with the help of simulation studies. I'm Suraj, I'm joined with Mr. Bharat, and uh, also it's been a considerable help from Amandeep in creating this presentation in place. Uh, so we'll talk, definitely regenerative breaking is something which is, uh, you know, most talk topic uh, like machine learning or AI, you know, in, in computer science sector. Uh, in EV, people talk about uh, uh, regenerative breaking. And in similar way, we talk about uh, SOC algorithms and, uh, you know, battery management systems and things like that. So I always heard from people, you know, uh, pretty crazed about these buzzwords, uh, which kind of pick them up. So I checked out a lot of videos available in the internet, and uh, I did not find something which is uh, you know very much detailed, and which gives the clarity to somebody to to do get a direction on you know what they should do in an engineering way. You know? So there are a lot of people who made videos and uh, capturing the regenerative energy by the bicycle, or bike, or something like that using some meters. But you know it's not like you know if you're an engineer you would do it in an engineering way because we use simulation tools at industry and uh, using those simulation tools we predict what is the exact amount of region energy then we go to the market you no know, and then we go to the field and test the vehicle we correlate our data to a real time vehicle so when I looked up on in the internet so there was nothing much credibly available as a source of information it was very clearly putting out you know how you should do region radio breaking energy calculations or an approach to do a region radio breaking. Uh, with the help of simulation tools, you know, um, that's that's what uh, interested me to uh, create this uh, session or a webinar or a, a video as a part of this today. So I would go starting from non-automotive applications. I will play a video uh, ahead of this uh, slide, uh, which I want to uh, take as an example that regenerative braking is not something just because of automotive. Regenerative braking is there in other applications also, in non-automotive applications. So there are applications which you see here on the screen is like an elevator, right? Uh, so we have a car, so when it has to go up, so we use a motor, and then when it has to drop back because there is a the stored energy, like a potential energy, which we call it as. So it would run the motor back again. So you produce some amount of energy. So it is always a different question. What do you do with that energy? We will learn that in the next video. Uh, but though there is a you know a reserved amount of potential energy, right? When we lift the car up to a, let's say you're at zero floor and you want to go to a 15th floor, and uh, so it takes the energy to go up. But when the the car drop comes down from 15th floor to a zero floor, so you would have that reser reserved energy that you can you know produce as the electric energy at the motor. Uh, you can dissipate that as in heat. Uh, that is what does in breaking resistors, or you can also convert that. Uh, to supply to the grid. Uh, so there are some complexities involved in electronically and electrically, but though you can do it, it is not something impossible. And uh, that's what I'll demonstrate in the video. So the same thing with the cranes also, when you want to lift an object uh, from, from a cargo, so you would, you would require an electrical supply to the motor. And when you want to drop back that uh, cargo to the floating area or let's say storage area. So you would have that energy stored as a uh, the potential energy. So you would drop it back. So when you drop it back, so obviously you would convert, you know, you have that possible, you know, uh, energy that you can convert into electricity and supply to the grid. And, you know, that kind of makes it more economically viable that you, you save the energy and you don't waste it. So your electricity bills comes down and, you know, you have a potential viable option. So this has been already there, you know, in the market, and this is not something very new. Uh, so what is an automotive as a specific word in region breaking? We'll, we'll understand that by you know going through the video and then further on. Uh, if somebody have uh, uh, a slow internet, it may be that you know this video may not be played well for you. But though I'll record this and I'll put it in the YouTube, so you could uh, definitely spare some time and watch it in the YouTube too. So let's uh, hear this video. Or what it talks about. It's from a KEB, uh, a company called KEB, who makes the components for a uh, vision. When lifting a fully loaded car in a traction elevator application, electrical power is delivered from the building utility to the elevator system. However, when descending, that same fully loaded car will regenerate energy. In other words, the stored energy in the mechanical system is converted back into electrical energy. Historically, for VFD applications, 
This energy was shunted across the braking resistor and dissipated as So heat. the meaning this of uh, the, the braking resistor is uh, where you produce that electricity at the motor and uh, this is a very frequency drive which is typically used in all the elevator applications. Uh, if you do not do the discharge then it will you know uh, uh, has a, and a harm the, the DC bus uh, at the uh, motor controls. Uh, we have to have a, a, a braking resistor, which is basically a huge resistor, which dissipates the uh, electricity in terms of the heat. Uh, that's why when you go to a, a elevator rooms uh, up on the top floor, you, you could see there's a lot of heat in the, uh, uh, that elevator room. That's basically because there is a the, the breaking resistor which basically dissipates when you go down, uh, when the electricity is produced when you go down. So that's what happens with the uh, breaking resistor. in two problems. First, the heat represented wasted energy. The costs to a building owner could be significant depending on the size, duty, and number of elevators in the building. Second, the additional heat in the machine room often resulted in additional cooling costs. There is a better, greener alternative. KEB's R6 line regenerative drive replaces the traditional braking resistor and can be used alongside the elevator drive. When an overhauling situation exists, the R6 regen unit goes active and commutates energy back onto the building to be consumed by other loads such as lighting or HVAC. The R6 is very compact and is available in capacities up to 500 amps. The smaller units can be used on both 208 volt and 460 volt installations and automatically detect the mains voltage and frequency. The R6 units require little adjustment and are easy to use. They feature internal DC fuses and programmable I.O. For applications that need to meet IEEE 519 power quality standards, passive KEB harmonic filters can be used to meet the most stringent levels. In addition to saving energy, the R6 line regen units save cool. money so, too. It was just to kind of overview on understanding what exactly is regenerative uh, energy. And it is not something only there in EV application, but the region is already there in many other applications from many years in place. Cool, so it's something as a new technology as such. Uh, but this whole uh, session is, uh, why is it uh, so much about automotive and how is it uh, related to automotive? So that's what we will talk about uh, uh, further ahead of this presentations. Uh, so you can consider the same situation uh, for automotive, like a downhill compared to an elevator. Right, or a crane. So when you're going up, uh, when you're going up the hill, it's like going from zero floor to 15 floor. When you're going, you know, coming down from 15 floor to zero floor, it's like downhill condition. So the, the typical situations are you let your your accelerator pedal position is zero, and maybe in a case that you might have pressed the brake. You know, if the vehicle is accelerating too much or going at a two speed, you know, maybe it, it's it's like 0.2. If you consider a bandwidth of zero to one. So zero being no press condition, one being fully press condition. So that is what downhill condition would represent, right? So uh, basically there, there is no motoring. There is the output come, because your accelerator pedal is zero, that means that you're not requesting any tractive power from the motor and there is no tractive energy coming out of the battery. So at that condition, so there is a control algorithm at your motor controller, uh, upon all these, uh, you know, conditions of an input to the control system. So it, it kicks in and then it, it identifies that you know, it can do a region. So, and again, it's just not like jumping into the control algorithm, but there are a lot of safety precautions in place to consider in, in, in activity. I'll, I'll cover that up in the next part of the presentation. So this is something as a case, you know, the downhill condition, exactly as same as an elevator. But you know as an elevator that, you know, it, it doesn't uh, have, uh, it, is a, it is a fixed device, like it, it operates between, let's say, zero to four, zero, zero four floor to a 15th floor. But if you take an automotive application, so the downhill can be anything. You know, it can be very steep, like maybe this angle is like hmm, uh, 30 degree, or sometimes the angle is, can be 5 degree, this angle can be even up to like 45 degree. It can vary, you know, it's not, even the government says according to the regulations that it can, it has to be somewhere about uh, 12 degree, I think. But still there are conditions like, 
like uh, uh, hill conditions or a mountain so you could see that uh, things happening so this is a typical consideration and they can convert it you can you know switch the motor to a region mode uh, so then the the motor will produce an electricity so then you could push the electricity to the energy to the, the batteries for the charging purposes so it's just not straight not simple as that but we would just consider for this presentation of simplicity so then in the next condition which is braking that's just simple case that you know you're going on a flat road uh, you see an obstacle ahead of you so you let off your accelerator and you press a brake that's what you do right you don't press your accelerator and then also press a brake so that's the condition when you can think about uh, uh, braking uh, so when you brake you let off your accelerator and you're pressing a brake and uh, you want the vehicle to stop so if you press a brake so you would you know, dissipate that energy in terms of the heat at the friction pads uh, so or else you can also uh, activate your region and then the regenerative energy can be produced and that also acts as a braking. So how does this example can be practically visualized? Uh, my, I believe you guys have driven a bikes or a cars around. So you're going down the hill, just press the clutch. Uh, I mean, it's not something you should do to take it a chance, but if the situation provides you, uh, you're going down the hill and you know, uh, you're, you're at, let's say a third year or something like that and just press the clutch. So what happens, you cut off your engine braking right the engine also have a frictional resistance uh, because the piston has to move up and down and all the components are set in a mode of frictional resistance so the the engine is causing some amount of braking but if you let if you press the clutch then the, you disengage your whole drivetrain from the engine then what happens you tend to move faster right so now imagine the same engine braking to act as a regenerative energy right so when you want when you want to produce electricity from the motor so the motor will offer a resistance that is exactly something like an engine braking but i'm just giving a correlative uh, uh, comparison uh, so that's how you can imagine the engine braking so sorry regenerative braking so again there's a complexity how much amount of regenerative braking has to be uh, considered uh, how much amount of uh, hydro Hi, uh, sorry about it. Just give me a second here. I will um, join back in. I'm not sure if there may be a internet disconnectivity. Uh, possibly. I will join. Give me a second. Here.
When lifting a fully loaded car in a traction elevator application, electrical power is delivered from the building utility to the elevator system. However, when descending, that same fully loaded car will regenerate energy. In other words, the stored energy in the mechanical system is converted back into electrical energy. Historically, for VFD applications, this energy was shunted across a braking resistor and dissipated as heat. This resulted in two problems. First, the heat rep Okay, great. I think it's audible for now. And uh, kindly confirm, is it a fifth slide? Bharat, can you unmute and just tell if it is a fifth slide? It is right to go. Okay, great. So um, talking about the, the topic here that, you know, how uh, the regenerative braking is different for uh, applications such as automotive than compared to a standalone application such as uh, elevators or cranes. So when you talk about automotive, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you go back to the application of an elevator, so you don't tell the elevator that you know to go from zero to four to fifteen floor in let's say five seconds. Uh, it's elevator company who defines what is right, and then it has fixed the values that what has to be happening between a zero to a fifteen, uh, sorry, yeah, fifteen to a zero floor, right? Uh, but in the automotive applications, it is not like that. It is a driver who defines what should be the acceleration, what the deceleration, right? The, the plot which is drawn here, it's an acceleration uh, which is velocity, uh, where we are trying to draw value of acceleration, uh, which driver is, uh, when the driver is driving the vehicle. So he's accelerating the vehicle and then decelerating. Deceleration happens when you break the vehicle, right? So that's the condition of deceleration basically. So now when we talk about uh, uh, this profile, which is acceleration and deceleration, this acceleration and deceleration depends upon various different parameters. The parameters may be such as uh, road condition, type of road, driver, I mean, whatnot in any other conditions. So all of them will combine together and define this acceleration and deceleration. So these are the values actually which contributes to the parameter of regenerative braking, so the regenerative energy capture, right? So acceleration is a motoring torque and uh, deceleration is a regenerative torque basically. So the thing is, it is not same as elevator that here we have our acceleration or decelerations in a very dynamic manner. So second thing is, uh, as we we're discussing in that video, that you know, there is electricity from the elevator, um, it goes to the R6 and then it goes to the grid, or it goes to harmonics and then it goes to the grid. Uh, when it goes to the grid, you utilize in the grid. The thing here in the EV application is, we have a battery, which is the, the, the where you store the energy, right? So a battery have some limitations. You know, you can't just pump in a lot of current within a short time of span, right? So it is having some limitations. So we need to think about those limitations. And braking is a safety critical system. It is a very important topic to understand that and I, I see a lot of uh, startups and you know, young entrepreneurs or even guys out there doesn't think about the safety as a critical parameter. If you talk about uh, braking, it would come in a very highly critical system because if brake fails, you know, the next thing is an accident, right? So according to uh, functional safety or with um, the ASIL standards and things like that, so we rate at it is possibly a D. So it means a very uh, safety critical system. Uh, so if, if the regenerative braking, it is not going to work fine, then the vehicle is not going to stop. Then if the vehicle is not going to stop, then you would see a potential hazard of an accident next. So it is not the same condition when you talk about um, elevator applications, right? So it is a highly safety critical system. We should be very careful about designing a regenerative braking. It means, you know, what is the percentage, percentage of split between the hydraulic brake and the regenerative brake? 
then it, it requires extensive control. So the control is an art of everything at today's uh, complicated of, uh, complications of uh, 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 systems and, and all of them to work together. The control engineering is a very important point of it. So we need to think about a lot of parameters. It is not just about uh, can you produce in regenerative energy, right? So whether your motor or controller is able to, motor is obviously able to, whether your controller is able to uh, do the region or not. But it is also about whether your battery is able to take the energy or not. Whether your battery is able to take that much of current into the, the charging requirements or not. So like this, whether, you know, what is a braking condition at that time? Is it a full brake, partial brake, all these things. So all of them come into a picture if you want to decide uh, a regenerative braking should happen or should not happen, right? So that is where complexity of automotive will hit into a picture. So it, it, this slide is all about explaining that, you know, yes, region is available in non-automotive application. It is not something new, but region for automotive application is uh, very safety critical. It is complicated. And there are a lot of parameters which you also derive the regenerative uh, to happen or not to happen. And also, estimate the amount of regenerative energy which you can capture in real time from the vehicle or not. So um, how do you see this regenerative braking in the eyes of a simulation engineer, right? So uh, we are a simulation engineers where we only trust anything with analytics, right? If it is not data driven, then it is stupid. So that can be only proven if you have uh, things like model-based design, right? So people do feel like you know, they can do it in Excel, but it, it's not that easy because it's a, it's, it's a very uh, complex system. There are a lot of parameters that comes into a picture. So you have to use simulation tools. So uh, the tools like Scilab, which is open source and free, uh, the tools like uh, MATLAB, uh, Simulink, which is paid. Uh, there are other tools also designed by various other industries. So if you are good in mathematics, if you're good in physics, your fundamentals are highly strong, you don't need to go for anything. You can still you know, work around with uh, uh, Scilab where you can write equations and you know, convert those equations into models in place. So we have some courses at Decibles, which is level two. I'm just trying to take this as a reference and trying to, to cover up you know, how actually we do a regenerative capture. This model, which is represented here, is in level three, but I, the part of this model is taught level two. So where I'll try to explain you how we actually do the regenerative uh, energy uh, calculations. The first and foremost importance is drive cycle. Okay, The amount of regenerative energy you can capture, uh, leaving all the control logics and safety criticalities in place, depends upon the drive cycle. So how do you drive the vehicle? If you decelerate very quick, if, if you have a road condition where it is a completely a slope, um, things like that, you know, which, which means you can produce more amount of region, correct? And um, that is why the drive cycle is quite important. Anything which you do with an incorrect drive cycle is going to be completely waste of efforts. So that your drive cycle is very, very important, which I've gone in the last slide here. It, this shows, uh, it is not a drive cycle, it is a derivative of drive cycle, okay? We have extracted the values and converted them into an acceleration. The rate of change of velocity is acceleration, but usually the drive, drive cycle is velocity with respect to time, right? So if you draw a drive cycle, so, you will get a velocity, let's say this is zero and because velocity cannot be negative. So V is your Y axis and uh, T is the X axis, which is time. So you can see like, okay, you're driving the vehicle, something like this, you know? So th this represents the velocity of the vehicle being driven. But the velocity and all these parameters which are included as a part of this graph, which leads to create this graph, right? So this graph has to be very, very important. That's what we first implement the drive cycle into the model, which is basically the chassis model. Cool. So then what we do inside the chassis model, we tend to calculate all the resistive forces which are acting. So what are the resistive forces acting on it? It's a rotating resistance, aerodynamic resistance, acceleration, and gradeability. Right? We try to get all these values. It sums up as a force. And then we know the, the value of uh, radius of the tire or a diameter of the tire. We use that parameter. We tend to get the parameter of torque at wheel, RPM at wheel. Okay, that's what we try to derive by end of this, uh, you know, the the part of this model. So once we derive there, then we will. If you have a transmission, if you have a direct drive, then there is no involvement of a transmission. If there is a transmission, because you have a specific gear issues and there is a efficiency parameters that's also involved you put those calculations here, then you get your motor torque and a motor speed, correct? So 
this is how you will be able to derive from your you know vehicle speed as a drive cycle to the motor torque and a motor speed so then we have uh, uh, approach to calculate the motor power here okay inside the motor and this is at a level 2 when you go to level 3 i'll explain we can actually calculate the motor current and the motor voltage with respect to rpm and the torque also but at this level 2 because it becomes very complex for the learners we have put only the motor power as a part of it okay so what you can do at this stage is once you are able to uh, get a drive cycle and come to this point we will be able to calculate what is the negative power at the uh, motor because when you see a uh, uh, drive cycle here as an acceleration parameter here there is a negative acceleration right so this part of the negative acceleration will become a part of your input to the region power that means it's a negative power right this is a positive power it's a motoring power and this is a negative power which is basically a region power that you can possibly capture for, as a regenerative energy cool. so to do that you have to have the model until this stage and by the end of this stage you will be able to estimate the negative uh, sorry it is negative power at wheel you will be able to come to this point and be able to calculate the negative power at the motor so if you integrate all of them all of that uh, negative uh, power which is coming out then you will be able to estimate the total negative power for a specific drive cycle so when we mean a drive cycle drive cycle has a specific distance right so some drive cycles are like you know 1000 seconds 2000 seconds and depending upon drive cycle it means the distance you travel the time you are taking to travel so you'll be able to calculate okay for let's say like a 25 kilometers uh, you are able to calculate you are able to capture about let's say uh, um, 50 watt right so this value is basically what we is what we derive it from the part of this regenerative power okay a negative torque of the the motor so then when you have the negative uh, negative power you can actually feed that negative power uh, to the battery model because in the level 2 we don't have an in-depth motor controller model you can feed your battery model at the battery you will be able to calculate the exact amount of um, uh, uh, energy you know that can be called that can be contributed to uh, 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 energy consumption at for a one kilometer or something like that so it's a watt hour per kilometer okay so any by here itself you'll be able to calculate what is the amount of region energy but if you want to substitute that to the battery model and able to estimate what is the exact amount of uh, region energy which you can capture at the battery that would be this value cool so if you implement all this model, I'll just try to go to the screen and try to describe. So you have derived from the drive cycle. Calculating, you get a velocity. Then from this, you will calculate all the resistive forces. So then you have uh, torque, okay, you have the radius of the wheel. You can, you know, convert this into uh, some of these forces, then torque and RPM. So you feed this to a transmission, you get the torque and speed, but this is at the motor, right? And this is at a wheel. So then you you know it's negative power, so you can accumulate the negative power as a part of the you know, uh, region energy, which is here. If you integrate all the part of this negative, negative power, then you will be able to get a total power that can be accumulated over it specific drive cycle distance right so this is this is a very simple way to calculate the uh, the, the region energy right so this is how the level two would kind of cover up uh, if you want to learn on the regenerative energy and then you can substitute the energy to the battery model you can calculate okay if you drive the car with region if you drive the car without region what is the exact amount of energy that can be captured by end of the uh, driving distance also can be calculated, right? So this is at a level two case. So when we go to level three, which is a uh, course at decibels, if we talk more in depth about what is realistically that can be captured as a regenerative energy, right? So until here, everything pretty much remains the same, but uh, there may be small changes in terms of the advancements at transmission, and also some of the advancements of chassis model that's not a point of discussion now but coming to the point of discussion here that we model the uh, motor it itself here which will be a completely an advanced model where you will be able to estimate the motor current 
एंड मोटर वोल्टेज इन रीजन में ओके और ऑल्सो इन ट्रैक्टिव मोड पे यू कैन यू कैन एस्टिमेट सो वॉट एग्जैक्टली वी आर एबल टू डू वी आर एबल टू डू डू समथिंग लाइक अ लंप मॉडल किया We just use like you know can be using like a PV power is equal to two point eight by sixty. You can calculate you know the torque, you know the RPM. You will be able to estimate the power. But the thing when you go to uh, advanced uh, real time scenarios, we should be able to estimate the motor current and a motor voltage. But that is a very larger model. Uh, we should have a lot of parameters to actually model the uh, motor, and that itself is about like you know quite decently uh, eight to ten hours of efforts. so if if you know that you know you can also get uh, simscape models for the motors and all these things it's great you know it's like uh, i don't know physics but i want to be an engineer you know so it, it's it's a fantastic way if somebody want to do things a lot of people are, does it uh, but i i feel the way that you know if you want to work on engineering and uh, component or uh, really estimating thing you should be able to write every line of equation and understand the physics behind it and then convert it to a model and because you know this is why the model is operating like this right if you get a somebody develop mask to model in in somewhere from somebody you never know what exactly is the physics behind it uh, it's not about fun of building it but it's actually about right way of uh, doing things so we take about there's a learning about like 10 hours where we actually only build the model uh, by by understanding all the equations of motor physics and things like that so we build a model and uh, inside the the motor so that model will be able to estimate the current and a voltage so how is this current and voltage related you see the motor torque here and motor speed here so but what you get out of the model would be the motor current and a motor voltage so because it is to know that what is the amount of current that uh, generated by the motor in the region mode uh, depends upon the torque available at the motor imagine if you break at a very low speed right that current is negligible you won't be able to use that as a regenerative regenerative current right you need to neglect that part of the current and the voltage of the output from the motor in the region mode depends upon the velocity at which the rpm at which the motor is rotating imagine you you're doing a breaking at a very slow speed and things like that you won't be able to you know even though you can capture the region you won't be able to use that part of the region right so because your battery is at a specific voltage and and the produced voltage is completely lower you need a lot of uh, power electronics in between to ensure that system works in a uh, requirement level so that is why you need an advanced model to go to a realistic uh, industry level requirements that is what it covers up in the part of the uh, estimating the motor current and the motor voltage so again if you have to implement a motor efficiency uh, motor efficiency in the uh, generative mode motor efficiency in the regenerative mode so if you would have uh, come across when we talk about uh, uh, motor efficiency the motor can operate this is the uh, uh, you know uh, i would say driving mode this is the region mode so the efficiency is not same uh, for the motor when it is doing a generative sorry when it is doing a driving when it is doing a regenerative so the motor efficiency is completely different uh, during regenerative so we should be able to implement all these things and then we should be able to estimate the exact amount of uh, motor output current and the motor output voltage in the region conditions with respect to the efficiency parameters also right so when you will be able to do that then you will get the exact amount of values of estimated motor uh, output voltage and motor output current and the region then once you get that thing you should be able to pass that data to a control logic right so that would be possibly part of your you know uh, Uh, regenerative control algorithms in place so there are a lot of different regenerative controls okay what exactly those regenerative controls are so as i said it is not possible to if i go to the further slides of it i'll try to be okay i will try to explain as a part of this so you won't be able to capture all the uh, uh, output current and output voltages in the region mode so we should be able to plot of a graph like this and and we will be able to estimate okay and remove the parameters where it is unnecessary to do a region okay there are parameters like this which is uh, again there is a lot of engineering which goes behind to choose these regions of operation just try to do it relatively so there is no the, you cannot use the region current or a region voltage which is produced in this section because it's very sensitive right so a lot of uh, similar case in ic engines you know can we capture the heat coming out of the exhaust and then use it for specific application it is sensitive heat you know you won't be able to uh, uh, relatively build a system around it 
even you try to build it, it will cost you a lot of money. It doesn't economically viable. So the same way here also, you won't be able to capture all the region current that region energy which is happening in there. So you should know what exactly the one which is way able to be used as a part of the battery charging process, right? So that is the kind of a logics which comes as a part of the uh, the controls here. Uh, I'll try to cover that part in the next uh, upcoming slides. So when we implement all of the logics, then you get a meaningful word called usable region. Okay. So this usable region is something uh, as an energy which you can actually use, right? With all the implemented control logics in place. So this is how what we cover the learning approach in the level three as a part of the modeling, modeling, modeling things. So by that, then you feed the model and then you can exactly estimate the region with uh, 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 logics, without logics, you know, um, all these parameters can be estimated as a part of it. So let's try to kind of get some glimpse on, you know, what is uh, that uh, as a model looks like. So we have a model that is in Scilab. We also have a model which is in built in uh, MATLAB too. If you have a license uh, to use a MATLAB, so we have an option for you to learn using MATLAB. If you have an option, if you do not have a license thing and you know uh, there are issues in place, so you can also learn using Scilab, which is free and open source as a part of it. So I invite our senior simulation engineer and powertrain lead, Mr. Bharat, uh, to share his screen um, to, uh, to showcase the overview of the model. Uh, Bharat, you there? Perfect, yeah, uh, Bharat is sharing his screen. Okay. So we have a uh, uh, screen visible from Bharat's laptop. So we, we have done the whole model as a part of the things which you see here. Uh, Bharat, can we just slightly go into the justice model and try to see through and uh, what stuff's in there? And we'll just jump in and I don't know, I'm just overrunning out of time. So so this is, this is a whole holistic approach, not using any masked models or anything of that from the same scale. So it's purely uh, equation driven and everything can be editable in a format. So this is how the whole model looks like, if you see around here. Uh, but can I just uh, quickly see some models in place, maybe the motor models and things like that. So uh, I think your other screen is not visible. Maybe you might have opened it, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, only the current screen is visible. Okay, yeah, it's perfect. So I think, uh, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's just possible for everybody to absorb everything. But this is how the model based design look like where we have a sub models in each of the models where we have a, uh, approaches to calculate different type of uh, uh, ruling resistance or gradient forces and all these things in place. Uh, we can close this button and so go to the next one. Maybe. Yeah, I can go to the motor model slightly and then we can run, run through briefly. Cool. So where we have a whole uh, lot of things which is coming in here to to kind of consider that you know how much uh, uh, current you can produce you know how much voltage you can produce at the uh, regenerative parts. So where we will be able to put a scopes and check uh, at each level what exactly the values are coming in. So now but let's let's just quickly run uh, this model and try to see some of the graphs which are coming out. And I have some of the graphs to showcase which are quite important as a part of the discussion. But uh, so if we can see how it comes up. So the model would take you know, a couple of seconds to run it because it is for the specific duration. So uh, so if somebody is, is like, you know, inclined to build a vehicle, so they, they actually should have a model like this because it is only with this, you'll be able to properly estimate all the, the required design considerations for a motor sizing, battery sizing. The most amazing thing is, you know, you can actually, uh, size the battery relatively smaller if you do a perfect regenerative energy calculations. Uh, if you take an example like a racing application, you know, so where the weight of the battery is very critical in that place. So you can't just keep putting a very big battery. Uh, so that's going to be cost intensive and also the weight intensive. So the cost is something is not a parameter for the racing, but the weight is going to be because it's going to affect your acceleration, you know, all these conditions in place. Uh, so you can uh, study, like you don't have only one driver, you would have like a couple of drivers in place. You know? 
uh, best driver would be having its highest performance of the vehicle. It means you can utilize the vehicle to the best of its uh, peak performances. An average rookie driver cannot be able to do all the best what the best driver could do, right? So you could perform the simulation studies and then you can, you can get to know what is exactly the battery size, uh, region energy which you can capture. If you do this many laps, you can capture this much of energy and you can store it back so that you, know, you will be able to potentially use that amount of uh, a region for your uh, uh, battery so that you can size your battery pretty smaller compared to uh, somebody else and that gives you cost competitiveness and also it gives you a, a weight competitiveness for the real-time applications you know you can also exactly estimate the uh, energy capture at various different drive cycles you can you can do uh, optimized sizing of your transmission that where you get your possible regions uh, getting to know the possible regions, you can even think about what is the possibility to extend the range of the vehicle, you know, and uh, overall in a bigger picture, how much amount of carbon you can save, you know, uh, uh, by not consuming the electricity to charge the battery. So that's uh, a, a lot of things which you can actually do if you, if you uh, know the uh, approach to do a proper regenerative modeling in place. So cool, these are some of the data which we generate from the, the modeling uh, so the, you see a lot of uh, graphs as a part of the aerodynamic resistance force and uh, gradability force, uh, acceleration, uh, accelerate F is equal to MA, that's acceleration resistance in, in place. So we can close the screen, but we can go to the next part. So, okay. so uh, I, can, I think you can just plot a lot of graphs on the screen and then just try to fit them into the page. And because I have most of the graphs that I can, you know, kind of run through to, yeah important graphs which comes for the part part of a uh, uh, region uh, understandings yeah so perfectly agree so it's a it's a job of a simulation engineer you know so we, we don't see anything without uh, a graph we don't you know judge anything without a uh, exact values, right? So we, we still know it is not something always accurate, but when you try to mature the model uh, drastically, so when you get a correlation between your real-time testing data and the uh, 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 model data, uh, it's a perfect correlation and you can still have like one or two percent variations, but, but getting the confidence to know this is what I can achieve out of the system is quite important. So here we will be able to estimate, you know, this is exactly the, the motor regenerative power. Uh, at every given uh, you know, second of the uh, model. We can implement controls and we can check or can tell, okay, you can't do go to produce, if, if you can't produce more than this, we won't be able to do certain region operations and things like that. You can put all the logics in here and then you'll be able to decide what you can do. So this is a overall graph to understand at the last that, you know, including the regenerative energy, uh, you can actually increase the range, right? So this is negative as a regenerative energy. It means you're producing that. If you sum that up, then you know you can actually consume less amount of energy from the battery pack as a part of it. Cool. So I think uh, that's an overall right, Bharat. I'm sure it's it's it, it takes about like you know many hours to kind of come to the stage what we can call as a complete uh, data of the model. So where you can enhance the uh, details to the battery model where you can implement your thermals when you do a region how much temperature is going to increase and all these things i'm intending to cover that topic in the next uh, webinar maybe but as a part of it you can actually uh, you know estimate uh, with region if i'm right Bharat, it is with region on the left side and without region on the right side i'm sorry it is uh, the reverse of that without region with region Okay, so cool. uh, we will be able to exactly evaluate what is the possible distance that you can do. I mean, it, it looks here close about uh, close about 25 kilometers as an extra range, and that depends upon what drive cycle. Now, it is not just uh, a, a figure you can believe. It, it depends upon various different parameters. You know, it, it, it possibly depend upon the aggressiveness of the driving cycle. You don't drive the driver, driving cycle like the way we have showed it in the real time condition. So that energy and the distance you can catch, you know, the extend by regenerative braking depends upon the acceleration and deceleration of the vehicle. Cool. Uh, I think we can close this, Bharat. Uh, and I think that's pretty much from your side. You can give the controls back to me. 
thank you, Bharat, for sharing the screen and uh, running us through the uh, scheme of the model. Cool. So I would have a couple of other slides to sort of run you through to give you some fair idea and understanding. So that's that's what that's why you know we need a simulation models to sort of come to an understanding uh, that uh, how you can analyze a system in the right way. So very important parameter drive cycle, which is which plays a very vital role if you have to you know uh, estimate something. Uh, so then the motor operating points uh, because it is quite important in, in a way that you know you should know where the motor operating points are to 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 know it's with respect to efficiency right so that is what is represented in the next part of the screen here you can see here there's the efficiency points so the same way the motor may not be very good in regeneration at some point you know maybe it is just 20 percent efficient or 30 percent efficient there is no point in going you know to, to do a region at those conditions so we should know maybe imagine if these portions somewhere in these portions you know, uh, it doesn't make any sense maybe the region the motor's region efficiency is just about like 25 percent 30 percent so it, there is no point in doing a region at that at those conditions so you should get this data from a motor manufacturer so motor manufacturer will give you all this data like a motor tractive efficiency, motor regenerative efficiency. Uh, so when you get the data, you plot your uh, points of operation on that efficiency map so that you know where is your you know, motor operating points. Huh? You can remove some of the points in the region. Again, this is not something straightforward. You should do a lot of research in engine doing. So to define those regions, and then by that way, you will be able to implement those logic samples. So this is how the motor current and voltage look like. We'll come to the logics as a part of it. Uh, so in the part of logics, the one is efficiency of the motor in the region region. Uh, so you should know there are some points which are not useful for regions. So you should just neglect those regions when if the region is going to happen. That is what your uh, motor control logics, uh, sorry, region control logics will be. So breaking at lower speeds and like doing a region at lower speeds is unnecessary because you don't produce enough to store in the battery. So you should identify them and skip those times. There's a limitation of electronics that you know how much you can do a region. Uh, there's a lot of uh, functional safety or uh, 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 safety criticality in splitting the brake. Uh, how much is to be given for a hydraulic? How much should be given for a region breaker? So you should do an enormous amount of tests to come and validate that. And okay, this is what exactly is right for region. You know, that's something which you have to fix here. And that that is an enormous amount of work to kind of define. And then your SOC strategy, because the the battery cannot be charged and discharged at, at any given uh, uh, current values. So there is a limitation of how much you can actually do uh, charge the battery with certain C ratings. So you should be knowing when you're selecting a cell also that, you know, can it really take a region? But for that, you should know what is the exact amount of region current you're trying to get in here. If you do a simulation models, you should know what are the current that you, could, you will produce in the, in the region modes so that you'd also have a possibility to think about selecting a light cell that can accept the regions. If you see the region as a very a promising feature and functionality. So there are some control logics we also have written when we're trying to implement uh, during the programs. So we, here is some data which shows with region, without region, sorry, with logic, without logic, what exactly the difference is. If you see these regions and all, we, have, we don't consider those regions in place. So we, we, do, we skip those points and those are all the points which are put in the logic control that it it just uh, eliminates those points uh, that it neglects them and then it only captures certain amount of uh, rigidity current rigidity values so i end up with when you implement with logic and without logic you can estimate okay if you do with logic without logic what you can think without a logic you will you may get a higher region power but it is not realistic you know, you can see the difference here. The there is a, the, the there's a exact amount of difference in in percentage when you see uh, a vehicle driven with region and a without region. So the SOC of the battery can be somewhere about 90, uh, 92, or maybe for the with logic it would be about a uh, little about 90, 91, somewhere about that. So it means doing and right implementation of logics do give you an accurate value and that's why you should know about logics and trying to implement those logics in place with the rigidity control so this is something which we have tried to uh, gather with the simulation data it's sort of a bird's eye view 
that uh, with soc uh, so soc with without con without logic soc with vision radio logic uh, so you can get the values which is uh, promising here in terms of uh, uh, by end of the drive cycle what is the amount of uh, soc left in the battery right so by performing all these studies we can estimate these values and this is what nissan has published uh, so they were able to estimate about 744 kilowatt hour when they drove the vehicle about 11000 so to make a simple math uh, so you can make that by if you if you convert to kilometers i think it comes about 17200 i believe so i think its average comes about 4.5 or like somewhere about 4 relatively so it means they are able to capture about four watt hour per kilometer of distance travel when the vehicle is driven about eleven thousand miles you know you see a very significant number you know 744 kilowatt so 744 kilowatt imagine so if you have to uh, convert this into a range of the vehicle so each kilowatt um, maybe the vehicle is giving about um, eight kilometers so if you multiply this with eight so it's about uh, sorry so it's close about 6400 extra kilometers uh, for a distance travel of uh, 17200 kilometers that means it's it's fantastically great because you you would have used the energy from the grid to charge 744 kilowatt and again there is a the, the the losses in the charging and discharging if you multiply that by 20 percent extra so you would get somewhere about uh, 75 75 is 150 so it's come about 900 so 900 kilowatt of energy would have consumed from the grid if you did not implement a region uh, for the vehicle so that is the significance if you see as a larger picture as an engineer that you know what you're trying to contribute uh, to uh, 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 environment by by making a right and you know amazing perfect uh, regenerative braking system is 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 something really really large. 900 kilowatt is, is a hell of a lot of energy that you would produce from coal. You would you would produce so much of uh, uh, emissions as a part of the environment. But here you would be able to reduce all that emissions, and it is being wasted. And you you try to recapture that. So that's the weightage of the the regenerative braking if you do it rightly. And so how do you learn a decibel? So we have two programs, which is this, which is this. This is uh, not open for everyone. Uh, if you want to take it up, I'm sorry, not this one. So this would be the this program. So you, you can we have taught most of the content we have covered uh, to be uh, needed for regenerative energy calculations. So this one is to start with. It's mandatory, and then this is the other model. Uh, so where you will be able to completely uh, estimate the exact amount of regenerative energy that you can capture. So thank you. So if you want to visit our website, so it's lms.decibelslab.com. You can go down here. So we have everything on the home page listed, which is level two, which is here as a part of the course. And then we have level three, that is uh, the advanced regenerative uh, energy capture. So I will be uploading these videos onto the YouTube. Uh, if somebody have missed it. So that is our, this is our YouTube channel, uh, Decibels Lab. Uh, so you can find us on YouTube and then do subscribe to the YouTube channel too. Uh, to to watch the recordings of this uh, session. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box. Uh, I should be able to take those questions and help you out with answers uh, with the knowledge I have.